morning. Um, very interesting set of pres presentations. I just wanted to make two points. Um, one, uh, we've spoken yet again about the egregious mistakes that we're always making in providing uh, support. And I was struck by the fact that even <coughs> in Tunisia and Morocco, that we imagine might be able to manage their agendas better, you also spoke about being swamped by external projects. And um, Amal mentioned the idea of independent assessment, uh, independent peer review. And I wonder if we might not make this just a little bit bigger and actually begin to establish some kind of a code of conduct for support to PFM. And if potentially this might be something that ODI could pick up. Independent peer review would be part of that, but some of the other things that Amal mentioned, um, annual coordination frameworks would also be part of that. A demand for transparency and providing information about what is done could be, could be part of that. And I think it would really um, begin to, to change things. But what we have to realize is that there are also lots of vested interests. Uh, part of the reason why we don't get independent peer review is because we consultants uh, want to carry on getting work. Mm -hmm. So even if we suspect our projects aren't quite working the way they should, we sort of cover over that a little bit. Our task managers in the fund or the bank or the development agencies are also embarrassed that they're not making progress. Uh, the reformer in government doesn't want to show <laughs> herself or himself up. So one needs to think quite carefully how to set up this type of code of conduct and how to really make it independent. Because if we leave it to the fund and the bank, it won't happen. <laughs> you know, with, with due respect, it's got to be a little bit more than just that. You know? <laughs> Maybe not ODI either. <laughs> the other point I wanted to make is just on form versus function. Right. Just to say very quickly that this, this also is a continuum. So, so um, Matt spoke about delivering textbooks or, or paying teachers on time. But if you're an educationist, you would say, well, that is also form. We're only getting function once children are being uh, educated. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's a danger of <laughs> worrying too much about <coughs> measuring function because certain functions can't be measured. Mm -hmm. uh, if we want yeah. to control contingent liabilities, we'll only know we're successful when those contingent events don't happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's obviously very difficult to measure. So uh, be careful of not searching for something that, that is a, a, a holy grail, let's mm -hmm. say. Thanks, Andrew. Very practical, very kind of focused on action. Thank you very much. There's a forest of hands over there as well. Thank you. Um, my name is Chris Wales. I, I just want to ask a question to probably to all of the members of the panel about crowding out, uh, and in particular crowding out by, uh, by the international institutions. Um, there are a number of ways in which potentially this, uh, this can happen. But uh, there is, it seems to me that there is a danger of, of the international institutions doing two forms of crowding out. First, crowding out by crowding out of the private sector involvement in, in projects that can be delivered by the <laughs> private sector. Uh, and the second is crowding out of endeavor by national governments. Uh, the, the first one is quite obvious. The second one is, uh, is, is more subtle. One of the ways in which the international institutions intervene in countries is by taking people out. And taking people out who are the best people within the governments and within the frameworks of governments. And you see that a lot. You see it in developed countries where, uh, where people are uh, people with very high skills in finance ministries and such like are encouraged to come to Washington uh, on very high salaries, far higher than, uh, than they get in their own country, and are paid tax-free there and have a very rich experience. Um, you see it even more in relation to developing countries where the same thing happens and where those individuals disappear from a stage where they are tremendously important actors. I've been recently to one of the very smallest islands in the, in the South Pacific, and there is an issue like that there. If you take people out, whether it's even for a limited period of secondment or whether it's for a permanent position, you take away a tremendously valuable resource, and all of this needs to be done with some care. Um, it's a pity if one of the impacts of, of the IMF, for instance, is that the very best people end up in Washington, and it prevents some of the national governments that really need to act effectively uh, to be able to mobilize their own resources within their own country. Yeah. Thanks very much, Chris. And there may be subtler ways in which you could crowd out government endeavor than just lifting the staff, but very interesting, yeah. Uh, Nick, Nick Manning from the World Bank, one of the, uh, one of the crowders. <laughs> the, um, just two... Um, <laughs> 
a, a, a couple of quick observations and then some questions. I mean, primarily stimulated by, uh, by Matt, but the questions really at, at all the panel. The observations very, very quickly. One is, Matt, you made reference to the, um, the sort of uh, what, what's now in a sort of a, a sort of a common sort of meme, a sort of you know a, a, a belief that PFM projects in general do better than other types of public sector. In actual fact, that's no longer true. When we've looked rigorously at that, the uh, the bad news is, in absolute terms, PFM projects do slightly worse than other bank projects. When you compare, when you control for country context then that disappears with any statistical significance, they're just the same. But the even worse news, of course, is that um, we've no idea if, if when they're successful, if whether they're actually leading to development outcomes. So there's a sort of, it's, it's a very complex issue, this. But certainly we, we, we can't claim that they've got a sort of, you know, distinctive advantage. Is that because the other projects have got better? <laughs> Maybe. Right, yeah, or, uh, but the methodology has changed quite well, significantly, changed. so that yeah, might right. also be in the, uh, in the picture. The, 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 the other very quick obs observation is just the, uh, the point that Andrew made about um, coordination. And um, my own views on this are, um, are sort of somewhere between sort of, you know, cynical and unmentionable in a sort of, you know, yeah, yeah. in a gathering like this. I don't think it's going to happen, right, you know. And an alternative that um, actually Philip and, uh, and I and some others have been talking about is what would more explicit competition look like? if we just accept that's in the nature of the, um, this very territorial, self-interested donor industry, what would happen if you made it a more active consumerist market? So it, um, now, the, 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 the questions. The first is on this, um, this issue of the indicators. And Matt, I think you put this on the table very well, very squarely. The, um, and certainly, it's, it's a huge issue. When we recently reviewed the um, indicators that are used in the bank's budget support operations, it's, um, it's DPOs then um, using a sort of a classification of behavioral, which isn't quite the same as functional, but anyway, behavioral means that something observably is now different as opposed to a law being passed. Then um, over 90% of the indicators that we use are not behavioral. Right, yeah. So we don't have a custom and practice of doing this. And this isn't because we're wicked, it's not because we're silly. It's because it's so hard. Right, yeah. How would we make it easier? How would we construct sort of menus of functional or behavioral indicators that practitioners could more readily access? Right, yeah. And very particularly, how would we engage practitioners within the development agencies, but also within government, helping them to suggest, here's a good indicator, I can offer some data on this point. We, yeah. We've made so little progress on that, but it's not just a question of insight. We need some practical ways forward. A, um, and so I'd be interested in the panel's thoughts on that. Second question is on the, uh, is on the skills. And, um, and part of the logic, and this came up at a discussion last night, part of the logic for the engineering template within projects is that um, you know, they're sort of based on, you know, as we all know, they're based on a sort of civil engineering sort of you know, model. Once the experts have come in and you've worked out all the specs and the quantity and how much cement you need and all the rest of it, from there on it's just a checklist. Right, you, know, you don't really need to know much to get this thing to go, right, you know. What, how do we build the skills within the development institutions, right, that could actually be more dynamic, be more proactive, that really could adapt <coughs> the, uh, the project as it goes? And these aren't just dialogue skills, they're also technical skills. Mm -hmm. So what would that look like? And then, the, uh, and then the third question is on the projects themselves. Within the, um, within the bank, I mean, we've just recently very, very tentatively put a toe in the water with um, P4R projects, Program for Results, which is our claim to, um, to offering results-based financing. It's very, very tentative. Renault has done a great job in terms of the work in Mozambique in using this instrument for, uh, for PFM reform. But frankly, it's pretty painful to do it. It's not, a, it's not particularly well suited to this type of work. Again, we're not going to escape projects. That's not going to happen. We have to have projects, right? But how might we have better types of design of projects that allow more flexibility? Yeah. And, and again, it's like sort of, to my mind, it would be really useful if, um, if there were more demand, more clamor from, um, from governments, from other actors in this field, saying just have a better model for your projects. Don't just do, a, do without projects because we're not going to do that. Yeah. Right. Great, thanks very much. There's a lot there, so um, I'm just going to add a couple that have come in online and then go back to the panel. Um, Albert Van Zyl, um, International Budget Partnerships, Cape Town, South Africa for Tim. 
You emphasise the importance of middle and lower level managers in budget reforms. You didn't mention political representation, representatives or public participation. And he just wants to engage with you on that, why, why the emphasis was there in your presentation. And then from Simon Stone, working with Ministry of Finance in Palestine with Oxford Policy Management um, for Matt. How do you sell PDIA to busy, frustrated, middle-level program managers in line ministries so that it doesn't come across as M-I-U-A-Y-G-A, -A, which is making it up as you go along? <laughs> um, okay, and um, I think I, I shouldn't start with you, having thrown that one at you right at the end. So, um, Marco, can I start with, with you on the responses to that? One? Uh, I don't have to. I can no, start somewhere uh, else if you Okay, want. which one? Let me pick the, the easy one then. <laughs> no, okay, let me head on this crowding out because I'm, 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 I'm guilty. Now, but listen, this is a lose-lose situation. Now, when I can hire somebody like, well, I hired one of Kenneth's predecessor, Florence. Uh, clearly, that creates a gap, or potentially may create a gap. Oh, thanks God, where Kenneth and, you know, Uganda, they had other people like that. But clearly, it helped me make my job much better in Washington. Having people like that helped me understand much better the situation on the ground. Now, again, blank is too, is, is too short in a way. What, what is the alternatives? We've used for many years to keep people like Florence or Kenneth or whatever in the field by topping up their salaries, which to me is almost as bad because creates all sort of perverse <coughs> incentives, uh, sort of tensions within an administration. So I don't think we have sort of easy solutions here. We have to accept that, you know, what we would like to have more of, have a more kind of sort of round tripping so that can people can come and, and go back. Now, so have some sort of bonding arrangement in agreement. So that because, again, if you manage to do that, then it becomes a win-win solution. Because people come to Washington, my job gets better because I learn from them. Hopefully they learn something, if not from me, by working in different parts of the world. And then they go back and they can bring back that. <laughs> this is not managed. It's left a little bit to individual initiatives, etc. So again, could be better managed? Yes. Now, do you want to make it sort of a fixed rule? It won't work. So a little bit of judgment. So I'll, I'll leave the others to Great. Thank you very much, Marco. Tim. Thank you. Uh, let me start with this issue, I think, of the issue of coordination, code of conduct. I think it's, it's a nice idea, but I, I mean, I, I just don't, I just don't think, I, 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 mean, I don't think the coordination is going to happen. I, I think the issue is, you know, this, the mixed messages, the confusing messages are always going to happen. It's how can we best support uh, the reformers to navigate through that. Yeah. And, and one of the things, you know, I think, again, to coin, to, to say to, to Kenneth is able to navigate, and I think he's through that, and I think lots of the international community may be frustrated with him because he, he is able to ignore a lot of the advice that he's given, and people then complain that the Ministry of Finance is not listening. But actually, it's not because he's not listening, but it's because a lot of what the advice that is being given is is not relevant to, to the problems that he faces. You can disagree with me, Kenneth, but that's my take on it from, uh, from the way, not just him, and the way the senior bureaucrats in the Ministry of Finance in Uganda behave now. But it's different from, from the way it was earlier on in the reform process. But in South Sudan, you know, it's very, very difficult uh, uh, for, 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 the, for the reformers to, to, to navigate that on their own. And so I think what we should be doing is working out ways of, of, of helping our, our <laughs> colleagues to navigate through, through the, the sort of the, the, the problems they face and the, uh, the white noise around the, the, the conflicting advice that they get. Uh, you know, in BSI, we've sort of tortuously tried to fit the program into, uh, a, into a diffid log frame format and, uh, and, uh, and try and sort of uh, measure what we do in terms of indicators. It, I mean, it is quite a painful process. But it's sort of alongside the sort of formal project processes. And what we try to do in South Sudan is, is every year to, to set us what we call a set of change objectives, what we're trying to change, 
we do have some indicators, but I don't think the indicators are the best fit. Is is actually to tell a tell a bit of a story about what we're actually you know trying to change in the budget process and tell it in a sort of narrative way. But at least that sort of gives us a sense of direction and to refer back to you during the year of actually did we did 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 we influence the change you want to do or maybe maybe it ended up in a different way. But but it, but even in a year you can't necessarily predict where where thing, things go. Uh, Albert specifically asked the question about the, the, I didn't mention the politics and the public. Well, I mean, I did sort of on the political side, did mention in passing, I mean, it's this issue of the authorizing environment. I mean, the way the, the, the work that we've done in service delivery has, has been, a lot of it has been, been building it from the bottom up. But there are two areas where we got, got political authorization. One was the, uh, the allocation of, of $100 million in the national budget to transfers. Now, that is a, a political authorization at the highest level of the agenda of supporting service delivery. So that's one political engagement. But ultimately, uh, it was supporting the bureaucrats in the line ministries to work through the service delivery agenda. And they are the people who sold it to their leadership. We didn't sell it. We didn't go as advisors to each of the... Uh, to the undersecretaries and say, well, this is a good idea, you should support it. We built the support within the line ministries and they convinced their senior people to sign this joint plan of action. So it's very important, the political dimension, and it does help having one of these high level champions, but ultimately it, the reformers are important. And I think that's what Marco said is, you know, it is very worrying if you're just talking to the Minister of Finance. You need, need the people beneath the Minister of Finance to, uh, to, to understand and hear the messages, but also working th up through the bureaucracy is important. But I mean, the, the public are also important, but it's how to build the, the consensus of the reform process. And another dimension of the service delivery uh, area that is coming out is social accountability. So it's working through the government around the social accountability agenda and bringing in civil society, but it's part of the process, but if we'd started with you need to have social accountability right at the very beginning, when we're talking <coughs> about aid on government systems, it would have confused people. So it's just one of those evolving things. Maybe I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Tim. Amal. Thank you. Um, I would react to um, the point that you made about uh, peer reviews and the code of conduct. I think that uh, sometimes when we talk about international organizations, we talk you know, about uh, institutions like monsters, and I think that it's not the, the case, because uh, uh, behind international organizations, there are people, and we have you know, people here in, in the room, and when, when we talk you know, uh, to these people, I think that we could agree on some of, of the issues. And I think that we could start with informal uh, coordination between people who are working in the same field. And then <coughs> uh, people inside organizations could push a little bit the organization itself to, to coordinate a little bit more. Uh, from my experience in Tunisia, um, I couldn't ignore the, the request of the Ministry of Finance to coordinate. They, they told me, look, we are having uh, projects with other colleagues of yours at the OECD or uh, at the EU. Please coordinate with them so I cannot just tell them, okay, I, I, I just need to implement my project and I have nothing to do with other people. So, and <coughs> very often you find people that can also listen and uh, accept to, to share. But I found the, the point of uh, Nick uh, very interesting to make maybe competition uh, explicit because there is obviously a competition but we don't talk about it and I'm happy that the word competition <laughs> came into the debate. Uh, I, I, didn't, I couldn't dare actually use <laughs> this term, so thank you. Uh, I think it's, um, if the, the rules are clear enough, I think it will help everybody, um, you know, uh, implementing in a better way uh, the project because the objective is, uh, everybody around the table has the same objective, so it's the interest <laughs> of, of the country. So I think if uh, there, there is enough uh, work for everybody, uh, a, a huge amount of work to be done in countries like the, the MENA countries, for example, you can start from, it's not only PFM, it's all governance is issues, it's uh, job creation, it's um, uh, tourism, it's all the sectors that you could imagine. And I think that there is enough room for everybody, but coordination is, you know, or lack of coordination is not a fatality. I think that we need to do something about it. We can start at the informal level and then push a little <coughs> bit to um, make it more institutional. Thanks, Matt. Um, uh, so I, I love the idea about, 
about competition. And I think the idea about, uh, you know, a, a, a consumer education uh, is, is really important. I mean, so I'll put a plug. We have a PFM course that I run with people in this room, and one of the goals is really to kind of empower people to say, if you're on either side of the table, how do you do a good job providing your product, and how do you do, do a good job working out what you want? And I think that that's what we want. The last thing that I want is donors coordinating around a, an even more rigid PIFA or an even more rigid set of the Germans will do internal audit, the French will do external audit, the British will do budget, because that's where coordination tends to end up looking like, and it's, it's a nasty beast. And it takes the menu away, it takes the options away, and it fixes an agenda, and it is not a good idea. So I, I think that we should be saying, how do we m m make <coughs> uh, agencies compete, and how do we empower uh, governments to be really good consumers? Uh, which would also be an interesting thing, because I wonder how many of the people in the field actually could represent their country systems. How many of the people in the field are hawking products that they could actually explain well and actually sell properly? Uh, I don't think that you know the standard of people working in this area is as good as it should be and as good as it could be. And I think that everyone would benefit because I think we'd get better people who have to do a better job and we get people who make better decisions. I think that's the first thing. On the metrics, I agree with you. I think this is a really hard thing to do, Andrew. Um, you know, measuring functionality. Uh, part of it is is not the outcomes, right? Part of it is the behavioral change element that Nick was speaking about. And you know, so I I don't I don't pretend to <coughs> to, to be there. I do think though that if we can't name it, some, if we can't give it a name, and if we can't give it some kind of metric, or at least un, un, understand where we're going to, we're not going to get out of the form approach. That's kind of my 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 real focus here. Is we need to be able to do that. And I think we can do it in some areas. It's never going to be perfect, and we're always going to be kind of on this continuum somewhere. But I think we can do a better job. Um, in terms of, uh, Nick, the, the um, I think that the comment from Nick and then Simon was kind of two sides, right? How do you sell PDIA to the donors, to the civil engineers, and then how do you sell it to the governments? Um, the first thing is I, I don't want to be selling PDIA to anybody. Because PDI is a set of principles on how to do something different. I do not have a consulting firm that sells PDIA. I don't know how to do PDIA. <laughs> the weird thing is I actually, I actually Googled the other day and I found that people are offering PDI courses in different parts of the world. And I would love to go and see what they teach. Um, <laughs> that said, that said, here's, I, I think that the principles need to be sold. Uh, and we need to work out how to do that. And, and here's how I would think about doing it in, in the donor organizations, Nick. You said it's a civil engineering model. It is a civil engineering model. When civil engineers decide what they want to do, however, they are very clear about the assumptions they're making about what they're doing. And they build in a mechanism so that they can test those assumptions on the go and so that they can learn to make adjustments. And in every single civil engineering project, and I'm not a civil engineer, but I have friends who are, there is space to adjust and to change based on what you learn on the go. Now, this is one of the things that is almost completely missing in the development sphere. And so, you know, my sense would be to say to people, how do we maybe work with the projects that you have and the project systems and the mechanisms that you have, but make some adjustments like that and say, let's make clear up front what are the assumptions we're making about the political space? What are the assumptions we're making about capacity? What are the assumptions we're making? And then let's ensure that within three months and six months and nine months, we have mechanisms so that we can test whether our assumptions work. Now, this is something that I think would go down fairly well in most donor organizations because I think people are really smart and they kind of get it. The other thing I would say is that there are many instruments in most donor organizations, bilateral and multilateral, that do give the kind of flexibility that we're looking for. <coughs> and in the cases that I look for, people use them. Okay? I don't know if they exist anymore, but the learning and, and, uh, uh, learning and innovation loan was, a, was directly about this. It was directly about this. The problem was people didn't use it. Okay. Now, I think you're talking a little bit about the culture of the organizations and the incentives people have and how hard it is to get something through the board. But the mechanisms and the instruments exist, and we need to work out how to make those instruments and those mechanisms more useful for people. On the government side, I would also say, I don't think we should be saying what you need to do is PDIA. I agree with you. It's, it, it's, I mean, what is PDIA? 
What you need to be doing is saying to people, do you really want to solve your problems? Do you understand what those problems are? And integrate into your processes, not a, well, let's just kind of try something and see where it goes, but a structured way of saying, let's have a conversation about your projects. And I think the conversation that Marco was saying, you know, in PDA, we don't just say start with problems, right? The interesting observation, remember I said was that it wasn't, the, the, the change didn't happen uh, at the point of the crisis. It happened after. So there was this process of work. And I think what you had in that process of work was identifying why the problem mattered, why it occurred, and what options you had to solve it. Now, you're not talking about an unstructured process. It's very structured. And now you're going to the minister and you're saying, if you have a real problem, instead of just assuming or pretending that the thing that you're being told to do is going to solve it, why don't we just spend a little <laughs> bit more time thinking a little bit more seriously about it before we commit to the one solution. I think it's very different from making it up as you go along. It's, a, it's not the same thing. Um, the other thing that I would say to Simon is you could go to the minister and say, by the way, in, in management theory and in the private sector, people are doing it this way more and more and more. So if you want to go look at how software is developed, people are moving away from the approach of kind of design it all and put it in. Agile theory is an approach that has emerged very like PDIA for exactly the same reason that we need it, is that many systems we had been developed that people then weren't using. So they said, well, how do we develop in a more interactive way so that it becomes a useful product? But I don't think you want to sell PDIA. You want to sell the vision and the promise of problem solved and of useful functionality at the fingertips of the minister. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, Verena, I think you were next. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for this very interesting and rich discussion, which I think you know, touches on a lot of points that have been in the debate on, on PFM reforms. By the way, my name is Farina Fritz with the World Bank. Um, I had a couple of points that I wanted to throw into this discussion. One is, you know, sort of the, you know, the Cape conferences have been an annual event for some time now. And perhaps to set this in the wider context, are we looking in the wider world at a structural shift towards better increasingly or incrementally improving PFM? Or are we looking at a world of eternal backsliding? So that we try, but our instruments aren't very good, and so it always comes back down as in a Sisyphusian exercise. Now, when we look at the quantitative data, which Matt also has done, what we actually see for those countries that have done repeat PFA, PFA assessments, more of them improve over time than stagnate or, or get worse. And we also know that, at least on the form side, a lot of countries have now if missed systems, et cetera. So is there ultimately a bit of a structural shift? And in some sense, this whole discussion about reformers and the advisors, et cetera, is you know, can we make that shift happen a little bit faster? Or are we real Sisyphuses and we're not getting it right and you know, because of all the bureaucratic incentives, et cetera, so it's, it's always sliding back. Um, then also, uh, in terms of the metrics, I think it is true that there's a lot of interesting metrics of what is working well or worse that would be good to have. When we were looking, when we were just trying to find out are civil servants getting paid or not, it's impossible to find that information for a significant number of countries. We found a couple of footnotes in some reports from Global Integrity. Well, that's not really good enough. So I think there's a lot of metrics, and even if I do agree, there's caution uh, about you know, believing that these metrics are fully the outcomes or the final effect on development, there's a lot of metrics that would be good to have. But as we know from the PFA exercise, it you know to really get standardized standardized metrics across a large number of countries requires a pretty pooled and, and sort of significant effort. So and at the same time, what Amal presented is we already have a lot of assessments. So thinking through how that could happen, I think would be useful. And just as a last point, or actually, if you allow me, t two last points. One is. In uh, Tim's presentation, you know, he looked at it from the perspective of the reformer, the perspective of the advisor. But I think we really should also look at PFM from the perspective of the politician. If I'm the politician, how do I look at public funds? What do I use them for? I give some to my supporters. I give some to the voters who I hope are going to elect me next time. 
some you know are let sift out in the revenue stream already so they never come into the pfm system as such and sort of you know and i do this depending on where i am in my electoral cycle letter so i think sort of keeping in mind how the politicians look at this and what matters to them um, depending on what uh, what situation they find themselves in i think we should never forget and um just to uh, back to Matt Andrews, I think you know you say this this um, PDIA is such a new idea. But when you look back at the history of this, Albert Hirschman was one of the first people to say, "Well, these blueprints are actually not a good idea." Yep. When he worked with the World Bank in the 1950s and 1960s, but yet you know it you know he was a, one of the biggest thinker in development. But still, the blueprint has been very resistant to change. So that's something we need to think about. And in part, I think it's so entrenched because, as you say, it's not always the best people in the field. So the, the headquarters try to control what happens by enforcing a blueprint. Yeah. Um, so these are some of the tricky issues sure. to, to work through. I think there's through. something in the value for money pressures and the emphasis also on being able to, you know, uh, if you like, a spurious sense that you can clearly define results ex ante from this kind of process as well. Let's take some more here. Start with Brian, then go behind, and then to you. Thank you. Brian, Brian Eames from ODI, uh, Budget Strengthening Initiative. I just wanted to um, push a little more on the issue of donor coordination and Amal's point about the consistency of recommendations between partners. What I find in my uh, experience is that you often have institutions having a bias towards a particular approach. Let's just say one particular donor is pushing for an MTF, one a particular donor is pu pushing for a, a um, program-based you know, budgeting approach, the other one is saying, no, 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 let's focus on annual budgets and get execution right before we move to that. And then they tie their financing and conditionality to those particular biases. And so you have these different types of models within a single country that has uh, contrary implications you know for the country both in terms of getting financial support as well as what is the best approach to do so my question is how do you go about really ensuring consistency of recommendations across these donors because it presupposes that there is one correct way or one better way uh, to pursue this given these different dynamics here it also pursue, uh, presumes that there's going to be a single lead donor overall or a single lead player who should be you know pushing and leading on that particular agenda, which I think is a bit problematic. A quick question for Matt is that in terms of the PDIA versus blueprint approach, to me it seems to me it's a question of sequencing, that you would start with the PDIA approach, but then when it comes to implementation, you do need something along the lines of a blueprint. So I just wanted to get your, uh, uh, your views on that as well. Thanks. That's great. Thanks very much, Brian. No. Thank you. Um, David Hall from Oxford Policy Management. Um, Firstly, I'd, I'd like to thank the, uh, the speakers for describing budgeting in the real world. Um, and I think we all recognized a lot of what was described there. Um, a, an, o an observation and then a, and a question, really. The first observation is on coordination. There have been a number of comments on that. Um, we see a lot of that being contracted out now. So although it may not be in the in the program description that as technical advisors you're supporting, informally you will be told and we expect you to coordinate with the World Bank, with McKinsey's, with your other um, counterpart consulting companies, with other advisory groups within the donor that is funding your program. That's just an observation. I don't know whether that's a good thing or not, but it's happening because coordination in a formal sense is very, very difficult between agencies. Um, that's, the, that's the comment. Um, just a qu uh, I'd like to throw back an observation to, to, to the, the speakers. Um, and it's about risks and expectations. And it seems to me in PFM, a lot of the risks are in the, in the formal sphere, if you like. So risks about programs failing are set out in, in complex documents. Um, and it's very difficult for agencies to move away from those. It's very difficult for governments to move away from formal documents that set out what a program should achieve. But if you ask about expectations, they're obviously, they're often a set of informal expectations from the same actors about what will actually happen. So I, I'm, I'm wondering if there are 
if there is a way of bringing those informal expectations into a more formal process. It's about are there indicators of function? It's about are there ways of describing progress towards the formal performance measures that we're all striving to achieve? And I, I was just struck by a side conversation that, that uh, we had with ODI's BSI initiative about how they're monitoring some of their work, which is through stories, <coughs> which is an informal way of reporting progress. And we contrasted it with the way in which, on another very large governance program that OPM is implementing, we are reporting progress or being required to report progress, which is against the blueprint. There must be a way of marrying those two, those two positions. And I just wondered the reaction of the, of, the, of the speakers to that. Thank you very much. I think, sadly, this is going to have to be... Oh, no, there's a couple more urgent ones. So quickly, maybe from this point, we'll uh, just take... Thank you very much. Uh, I am Baburam Subedi from Nepal. Yeah. Uh, uh, working for the Public Financial Management Reform right. Division right. Uh, uh, in Ministry of Finance. My question is... Uh, team, although, however, uh, most of the questions have uh, addressed by Matt. My fundamental question to team is that uh, you have, well, you have highlighted the middle level uh, managers and leaders, sense leaders. Uh, that's fine. The fundamental question we are facing worldwide in uh, developing countries is that there is a Problem of acceptance, you see. Uh, I, am, I am working for the, this is an example, I am working for the uh, reform pro uh, programs. And uh, there is advisors that uh, they will say from the side, uh, uh, visiting to my boss and minister that, the, this young guy is propagating you and teaching you the lessons. And uh, my boss in the top will say that, oh, you, the newcomer guy, will coming to me and teaching me about the lessons from outside. And there are other fears. Oh, this is the new guy, and which is provocating to work us. He's my colleague, and he's imposing me for the, uh, the betterment. So in such a kind of situation, how you will suggest to make a vertical coordination, not only the uh, horizontal coordination? That is my point. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's very well put. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to take two more quickly from Neil, and then I think the gentleman at the Thank back you. knows with the two urgent ones. Thank you, Neil um, Cabri. Um, just three quick points. Um, Tim, I, I like what you, what, what you said um, about the need to empower the receiver of the TA um, in, the, in the way that they're going to then interact with the providers of TA. I however think that there's, you should be going one step further, and that is that w where the receiver of the TA gets that confidence and, and is empowered to interact with the provider of the TA, what often happens is that the receiver of the TA demands coordination or better coordination. I mean, if you, if you should ask the Rwandese, for instance, I mean, what has been some of the successes in the way that they've interacted with donors is that they, they would say that they developed the confidence to get their donors to better coordinate. Or to, um, and, and I think the term that is often used is the division of labor. Yeah? Um, the second point is this point that's made about the possibility of a more competitive environment. Well. I think the implication of that is that it's going to work if there is a real marketplace. Um, and I would imagine that we'd probably need a hell of a lot of budget support mm -hmm. where, yeah. the the, yeah. where the recipient is given the money to buy the product yeah. Yeah. and to choose which product he's going to buy. Yeah. So the World Bank may have to give money for the recipient to buy a product of Difford. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third point, Matt, um, I, I, I think that the reason why Trevor Manuel was such a good finance minister was because they had training as a civil engineer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. <laughs> I'm going to take just the very last comment. Apologies to those. It's the apologies to those who I haven't reached, but we're running over on time now. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Many thanks for uh, this is me, Yosef, from Republic of Yemen, Ministry of Finance, budget specialist. 
and I will speak on behalf of my colleague, Mr. Ali Shamahi, Deputy Minister. Just one now. Yeah. Is this clear now? Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. This is me, Yusuf, from the Ministry of Finance, the Republic of Yemen, Budget Specialist and Director of External Finance Relations. And I will be speaking on behalf of my colleague, Mr. Ali Shamahi, Deputy Minister for uh, Budget, okay, the Ministry of Finance, the Republic of Yemen. First of all, First of all, I would like to mention three main objectives and three, kind, three main points that ha and I would like to make some focus on that. Okay. Just would like how can we be able to get advantage of what we have heard yesterday and today. First of all, I would like to talk about reforms and the capacity of the situation and how to apply that. And how can we how can be able to reach to the outcomes of all these reforms we talked about? I think that we have talked too much about uh, I mean the requirement, standards. I think we are in Yemen have modified all the laws and legislations of the requirement and under law. Many, many enterprises and many, I mean, enterprises and organizations was established regarding to all this, I mean, requirement and uh, tenders. Models and also we have established anti-corruption organization. But unfortunately, the outcomes of all these were not satisfied. My question is. We just would like to give the experience of such successful countries, just like on Uganda and other African countries. Just would like to apply that and reflect on our country. Great. I, at this point, I think that's a longer conversation. The, the lunchtime session around the Budget Strengthening Initiative, I would strongly encourage you to attend that. I think that will address a lot of the points that you've raised there. But thanks very much for coming. And we will be happy to follow up in, longer ter in, in a longer term as well on those questions. Thank you very much. I'm going to return now to the panel and um, start with Matt. Um, OK, let me, let me try to go through, again, great questions. That Verena's gone. Uh, j just, just uh, my, my first response to, to Verena is absolutely, there's nothing new about PDIA apart from the fact that we gave it a new name and kind of resurrected peop things that people much smarter than us thought about before. The point is that uh, it, it still isn't uh, taking, getting traction, so it is an interesting thing. Um, the, the idea is, uh, you know, do you start with the PDA type process and then move on? I, I think so. Interestingly enough, in the data that we have, it kind of suggests that it may not be that simple. But I do think it's kind of a blend of them. It does seem that you, you I would argue, you have a period where you do PDA and then you move into the other. Given that you need a fairly simple way in which you present, where does it fit? That's where I would put it. Um, I think that... Um, you know, speaking about how, how would you do the financing of this and one of the problems of the donors with all the ideas, tying them to all the ideas, I would love it if all the donors just created giant trust funds that were regionally, regionally relevant, big trust funds, and that you would then have representatives from the governments working with representatives from the donors to manage the trust funds, and countries drew on the trust funds by identifying problems applying firstly for small amounts of money, like you would for seed financing if you were doing something for the first time in the private sector, 
uh, the donors then would not be handling the money whatsoever because it would be coming out of the trust fund. The donors would be providing the menus of options. You would encourage the trust fund that the governments would experiment with two or three of the ideas. So let's try what the Germans and what the World Bank and what the IMF are saying. Uh, and you would have a period in which the money was small because one of the problems with the donors also is now it's big projects rather than little ones. So this process of kind of flexible iteration is difficult. And then when they get to the point where they know what they're going to do, then they could reapply to the trust fund for the bigger amounts of money. But you don't have to go to the individual donors who are all holding you hostage to go with their specific idea. Now, the one thing where I would, so that would be my idea of how I think the world should look. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I would like to actually suggest it because it's on film as a serious idea. A lot of people are thinking about the future of the World Bank and the future of the IMF and the future of all of this. And it kind of just seems to me that there's some very practical ideas that are one step away from the conversation we're having now. If we're willing to kind of learn a little bit deeper, this could be somewhere we could go to. The observation I made about where outsiders and specifically donors made a difference, remember I said it was where they introduced money without the connection with ideas. When ideas were introduced, the ideas were introduced separately to the money. It wasn't this thing of take our money and do this or else. Um, the, uh, you know, how do we do the monitoring, the, the learning with the stories? Uh, a colleague, uh, uh, Land Pitcher, has written a paper. It's all about me. It's all about big M, little E, and big E. Basically saying it's all about doing monitoring, evaluation, and then experiential evaluation in the middle. You have to think about how all of these things are useful to you. We don't do much of the other, of the experiential evaluation, which is the stories and telling, you know, but we need all of them. Um, to the, 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 uh, the colleague from Nepal, um, you know, I'd love to carry on the conversation with you, but one of the things, remember when I went through the list of all the functions you need, all the leadership functions? Now, th I think one of the points that's diff easy to miss about what I was saying is, you could say, well, what he's saying is need a lot of people. No, I said you need a lot of leaders, okay? It's a different thing. You need a lot of people exercising leadership, providing different functions, not a lot of people. You need a lot of people who are stepping out and taking risks. It sounds like you might be taking too many of the risks. The question is, if you're the young person who's coming from the outside, what is it that you really bring to this? Well, you aren't the minister, so you don't bring the authorization capacity. The minister does, right? Uh, y y the minister probably needs to be the convener. You may be doing a bit more of that than you need to be doing. You're the person who can help him see the problems better. You can help him think about the ideas. Maybe you can help him make some connections that he didn't have. But if you find yourself checking all the boxes and saying, I do all nine of those things, you're probably exposing <coughs> yourself too much and you're probably not doing a good thing for the reform. You need to think, how do I construct a broader team where other people are providing leadership around me so that I can move with confidence and I don't always feel that people are saying, why does he get so much time with the minister, right? And I think it's a broader lesson is if you have one person, I may have misunderstood what you were saying, but the broader lesson, I often find people coming to our classes and they kind of say, well, I'm the man, I'm the one who does everything, or I'm the lady, I do all of those things. And I say, your reform's going to fail. There's just no way that you can do all of those things in a sustainable way. So one of your strategies needs to be, how do I build that team around me so that I have all of those people that can help me? Great. Thanks very much, Matt. Amal, your final yes. thought. Yes, very quickly. I know that we are running out of time. Just um, quickly about the comments of the, the lady from the World Bank. So I, w I was mentioning the, the PIFA, and I think it's a great instrument. Uh, it's it's like a picture that gives, uh, you know, a picture of the system at uh, one. Uh, it's a period of time, and then we can two years, three years, five years uh, after that have a, another picture and see what are the, the achievements. But as you said, um, sometimes it, we 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 notice that there are changes just in the format, and there is no real change. Uh, all of the many countries are now uh, implementing or using the medium-term expenditure framework, but when you look really at, uh, at the, the Ministry of Finance or at other departments and what they are doing, we realize that it's not really working. So I think that we need to go a little bit beyond just having the makeup and saying that, yeah, we are using these instruments, but in reality it's not. And I agree entirely regarding the, the importance of the point of view of politicians. We didn't talk maybe a lot about that, but in the context of the Arab Spring, it's something very important. And in the case of Tunisia, um, recently, in the middle of the Arab Spring, they had to 
make a um, non-sustainable decision to increase salaries because they had uh, people in the in, in the streets every day and they had just to do something about it because uh, investors were leaving the country uh, tour tourists you know uh, just cancelled all their travels to Tunisia and uh, the situation was so difficult that they had to make choices even if uh, from a budget point of view the, the, the decisions were not the right ones to be taken but they still decided to do that because politicians wanted to, to stay in place. Regarding co the donor coordination and consistency of recommendations, um, I don't think that we can just give the lead to one donor. I think it's impossible um, because uh, maybe some donors have a lead uh, um, on uh, one topic or uh, another, but we cannot just say that this donor has the leadership. Um, I think it's uh, it's still possible to, to coordinate, and I think it's not a luxury, it's, it's a really a necessity. Uh, when I was mentioning this, the, the case of the, the budget review in, in Tunisia, it was funded by Germany, for example, and the, the EU was running uh, another project on budgeting at the same time with the twinning with France. So I think it's w within the same context, it's um, Germany is part also of the EU, of the OECD, so I think at some point, organizations or need to, to talk to each other because otherwise, if the, the project of the OECD is saying that you need to go to into this direction and then the, the EU says you need to go in the, the, the different direction, I think it's <coughs> it will also jeopardize the, the reputation and could break trust. And you know, I, I received this kind of comments, just agree among yourselves and then come to see us and you know, we are lost a little bit uh, between all these uh, these projects. Um, I just wanted to add the, a quick comment on on the trust fund and <laughs> the, the idea that you just mentioned. Uh, actually, the the private sector is taking the lead in in this. And for example, I wanted to mention two similar funds to, to what you were mentioning that are uh, managed by PwC uh, now. One is on education of girls in, in developing countries, and it's uh, um, a fund of uh, 300 million pounds, and it's exactly the scheme that y you describe. So it's first having the money um, fundraise um, uh, in the first place, and then identify the needs and have um, uh, you know the money available to react quickly, because sometimes between the, the time that we identify a need in a country and the time that we fundraise and we, s we can really start <laughs> implementing the projects, we have six months or a yeah. year. So the momentum, sometimes the political momentum or the economic momentum is already gone. So I think this is uh, something that is already um, uh, done in a in <coughs> few, in, in few cases. There is also a similar fund on uh, climate change uh, in developing countries. Yeah. Thanks very much, Amal. On donor coordination, it's kind of interesting how pessimistic the tenor of the discussion is about sorting out political economy issues at the level of donors and how sometimes optimistic we are about doing it at the level of countries. But anyway, Tim, just quickly. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Uh, let me start with this issue about, uh, you know, the PDIA versus, versus uh blueprint. I mean, I think the example that I gave on, on service delivery, I think, encapsulates that quite quite well, because the num there are a number of problems that were there, and you solve through them, and the solution is quite a conventional sort of uh, 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 sort of almost blueprinty approach. So we design a, you know, a, a, the government designs a, a local government PFM manual, and that has to be rolled out to 79 counties. And, and, and uh, and that involves a pretty linear approach and a plan to make sure everyone's covered and, and et cetera, et cetera. So, so they're various and similarly with the human resources thing is exactly the same type of thing. But the whole journey to get there was not a linear process. And I think that's an, an important thing that we shouldn't be th saying it's one, one, or, one or the other. Uh, and also, I think it's a parallel example sort of linking to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Matt's idea of the trust fund. I mean, what? In, in many ways, uh, BSI could be thought of as that first a little bit of seed money because yeah. we're pretty small, haven't got very much money, but we're able to get the process going. But a lot, a lot of the issues of implementing, say, the issue around rolling out a county PFM manual in somewhere like South Sudan is very expensive. Yeah. 
And what a lot of time Emma does is trying to get the pieces of the jigsaw together and right. finding donors to fund this bit or this bit of the thing. <laughs> and that also, de facto, is coordination as well, of actually getting, getting the donors to coordinate around this the one sort of manual and getting them to, to, to implement that manual. So I think it sort of brings some of these, idea, these ideas together. But importantly, I suppose where I'm pessimistic is that we'll never get a consistent set of advice from, from, from partners but at a lower level of getting things done in terms of implementing a linear pr plan on the ground in a country, I think coordination is probably possi possible. So I not, shouldn't be quite so, sound quite so pessimistic around that. Uh, this issue of vo uh, vertical coordination, it is a tricky one, but I think I agree with Matt in terms of those who implement the reform is not the, the sort of the reform secretariat, it's the, the line departments within the... Uh, Within, within the Ministry of Finance or even the line, line ministry. So, so it's more the, you know, but it's a danger, and I've seen that reform, reform secretariats become the reformers rather than playing the facilitator role, bringing the people together. And so, and one th we've, in South Sudan, we found this very challenging, one of the big challenging things is to get senior management to sit together in the ministry and agree a common position on, on something. But that's a key thing on, on, on team building. So hopefully next week we've got a senior management retreat of all the senior management in the South Sudan Ministry of Finance. And the whole purpose of that is to get some collective ownership uh, ac across, uh, across, uh, across the ministry around, uh, around a sort of a unified ministerial reform program. Great. Thanks very much, Tim. Marco, a final uh, word. Uh, I guess sort of on coordination, I'm kind of may sound like Nick, I probably have I've seen it all, so I'm a bit <laughs> too old and too, too cynical. But uh, there is already competition. Let's not kid ourselves. So it's kind of a hidden form of competition. Now, do we want to make it more explicit? Sure. To me, it's, it's already fairly sort of explicit. What, perhaps, again, pendulum again, back to basics, what kind of goods are we offering? Is this a private goods or a public goods? What we, we some of the advices we do, to me, it sounds more a characteristic of a public goods. Other is more of a private good. So again, buying an IFMOS or providing training. So then we have to reflect a little bit on the characteristic of that. Coordination, at the end of the day, I mean, the way it works, it can only happen in the field. We all keep in seat ownership. Country has to be on the driver's seat. A country doesn't even have a car, so <laughs> level out the, 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 the driver's seat. So we, we have to really be realistic and really empower countries. We had documents in Concord that the country should appoint and lead agency at least a certain sector or when it comes to PFN strategy. It just doesn't happen that way. I mean, there's a lot of kind of hidden competition. There is contestability. So I think, I think that could be where, where is with Philip. That's another interesting piece of, of, of research, perhaps, and also for future reference, for a future conference. We've been discussing yesterday, what are the incentives of donors? I, I was one of the proponents of an open sort of trust fund donors to give money to the IMFs, and the IMF would set priorities with countries. Donors have their own accountability incentive system, and they say, aha, uh -huh, I really want to know what I'm going to do with money of my taxpayers, what am I going to do in country X, Y, and Z? We create all sorts of problems for us because we have the usual equal treatment sort of assumption. So I cannot really take can, uh, money from a donor and give it to Rwanda and not to Zimbabwe because, so it's, it, it's really fairly complex. But going back, countries should really be in the driver's seat and, and they're, they're not, unfortunately. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Marco. And many thanks to all of you, all of the, the four panelists in particular. Um, a couple of things stuck in my mind. One is the, the giant trust fund idea as a sort of way of moving forward in terms of creating a more functional market um, situation, which obviously we haven't got at the moment, and that's obviously a major issue. Um, I also love Marcus, uh, Marco's phrase, there is nothing technical in this business which is also a good way, I think, to close this. Now, I, um, I just want to quickly highlight the lunchtime session. Um, is Marcus here? Is it? Yeah, can you just speak very, very quickly and introduce that, please, Marcus? Um, thank you. Uh, ODI is very keen not merely to give you a free lunch, but also to pick your brains. Um, and for those of you who p would like to be able to do so, if you can join us at 5 to 1, so 12.55 in the room just opposite, where we'll be asking you about this budget strength initiative, which has basically been a collective picking of brains in the past. 
and but seeing what you think about what we're doing, whether we can improve it. But also, we'll be following up on the issue around giant trust funds, because I think the issue isn't just BSI, it's the market. Right. Matt and Anne have very kindly agreed to be part of that conversation, so the conversation will continue in there. If anyone would like to join us as well, please do so. And if I can also just take the chance to welcome Tani Brunson, who is the director of the Budget Policy Unit in Liberia, and has spent the longest, I think, the longest time getting here. She started traveling on Monday, thanks to UK immigration complications. It's taken her three days to get here. We're delighted she's now here. But if you've been waiting to see someone who is grappling with some very, very real major budget problems in a very difficult and challenging environment, you have one day to catch her, so do catch her now. Thank you. Okay. Bye. And finally, just uh, to thank the panelists again for what was a really rich session. Um, I think it would be really challenging to try to you know, pull together everything that came out of it. So just a final round of thanks for your <laughs>